All right, Galatians chapter 5. This is the apex of the book. The quintessential idea begins in verse 1. Read with me 1 through 6, and then we'll pray and get started. Galatians 5, 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. The title of the message is No Middle Ground. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that you'd help me in the delivery of it. We've already prayed in worship. Now I just ask, Lord, that you would guide every thought as we Discuss your word and the eternal importance that it has. Lord, let us leave here having a conviction of, of your thoughts on this matter. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> no middle ground. Well, I don't know if you remember finishing up chapter 4 as Paul is giving different analogies to describe why Judaism, which really we can sum up in this way, works-based religion and grace-based Christianity do not mix. They don't mix. They don't go together. You can't work out a compromise. It's not going to work. And so it, a, as he gets to the middle of chapter 4 in the letter, he's eliminated any argument that those Galatians who are buying into this Judaism might have had he just strips every argument uh, away and lays the case out that Jesus Christ is the only way, right? He is, he is the only way of salvation, and now the Galatians are faced with this dilemma, this conundrum. They have to confront these Judaizers who've worked themselves into the church and get them out. Who knows how long they had been there? Who knows how many of them were there? or how many families had joined, or people that had become part of that church. I, I, I don't think there was a whole lot, but enough to be a significant influence to where they didn't want to mess with it. I mean, who likes confrontation? That's just not something anybody likes. So at the end of chapter 4, he gives the analogy of having more than one wife and how bad of an idea that is. And and he uses the illustration of Abraham and Sarah, a picture of the law and a picture of, of faith. And, and he shows how there can be no compromise. There, there, there's, you can't coexist together. Faith and works for salvation cannot coexist. Faith does produce works, but not for the purpose of getting saved. You, here's what you have to do. You have to cast out the bondwoman. That was the conclusion of chapter 4. And now as he gets to chapter 5, this argument crescendos to its highest point, And Paul is at his most passionate in this discussion. And, and there's only a slight nuance in the change uh, of, of uh, uh, subject here. We go from one of cohabitation in chapter 4 to compromise in chapter 5, right? Cohabitation is where you do your thing, I do my thing, and we'll all get along. Well, a religion by faith and a religion by works cannot cohabitate. So in chapter 5, he addresses the issue of what if we compromise, right, for the sake of unity. Boy, we had a great message on unity on Saturday night. You need to listen to that, how beautiful it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And maybe that's what they're thinking. Maybe they're thinking, okay, if we can't cohabitate, maybe you give a little, then I'll give a little, and we'll find a ground of compromise that we can both come together and bring our faith and their works, their Judaism, together, and we can still be circumcised, and we can still practice these Jewish traditions, and it'll all work out. I mean, 
for the sake of unity. And so that would be the nuance of this text as Paul addresses the fact that there is no middle ground. No middle ground. This is quite possibly the apex speech of Paul's entire life, his entire ministry. The, the passion here, I was trying to think of like, how do I, I'm a pretty passionate guy, but sometimes you read a passage and you say it and it's hard to communicate the passion that's underneath the words, you know. There's a lot of Greek here that has emphasis that doesn't come out naturally in English. And I have the advantage of studying a Sunday morning message for like eight hours, you know. So you don't have all that backup information. And so I, ca I can just say, well, he's passionate. And you're like, yeah, I agree. But it's like, no, 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 no. He, you didn't get it, you know. And, and it's, it's, like, uh, it's like if you've ever seen, uh, not Rainier up close, and I know you have. But telling people who haven't seen that, you know, it's like you can't just describe it. You have, you have to go see it, right? Yeah, it, it's an amazing thing, you know. And, and here, I'm telling you, Paul, it, j just some of the words he uses, and, and boy, I can't wait till we get on to the later verses into this chapter. I mean, he is like, he's been more direct in this chapter than I have ever seen him before. I mean, he's just like, it's pretty, I'll, I'll tell you about it later. Come back later and find out, right? So, I mean, he's super passionate and he's like look at me look at my face pay attention to what i'm saying that's in verse two i mean he's really really passionate about what he's saying but it's hard to express the zeal in this opening declaration on liberty <clears throat> from paul's impassioned heart that is until you compare notes with another legendary speech on liberty you may be familiar with made to the second Virginia Convention on March 23rd, 1775 at St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia. Maybe you know of what I am speaking. One impassioned man <clears throat> rose to give a speech so powerful that it swung the convention to pass a resolution to enter the Revolutionary War. A speech so powerful it went down in American history as one of the greatest speeches ever given. A speech that ended with these words. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Genuine may, uh, gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet? as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. You know the speech by Patrick Henry. According to Edmund Randolph, the convention sat in profound silence for several minutes after Patrick Henry's speech had ended. George Mason, who later drafted the Virginia Declaration of Rights, said that the audience's passions were not their own after Henry had addressed them. Thomas Marshall told his son, John Marshall, who later became Chief Justice of the United States, that the speech was, quote, one of the boldest, vehement, and animated pieces of eloquence that had ever been delivered, unquote. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? Edward Carrington, listening by a window, was so affected by the speech that he requested to be buried there. And in 1810, he got his wish. You can, at least from an American perspective, for those who love and appreciate our history, I think you can relate to the passion that was delivered and what was at stake in that speech for the defense of liberty by Patrick Henry. What made the speech 
so profound was not simply the passion with which it was delivered, but the shift in thinking, the speech masterfully accomplished. Patrick Henry, and, and please understand what he was doing, Patrick Henry was erasing the middle ground of compromise with British tyranny. Because in the delegation, there was this debate from each side. One said, we need to resist uh, the British and, and they're taking our freedoms. And the other side said, but we can compromise with them. We can find a middle ground. And it went back and forth until Patrick Henry so masterfully got up and eliminated the middle ground with this speech. He said, there is no middle ground. Either you were free to live according to your own conscience or life wasn't worth living at all. For bondage and oppression were no way to live. He did much to convince our hearts and minds since then of that same truth. That bondage is no way to live. For Patrick Henry, the only acceptable outcomes were liberty or death. That's powerful. You really, I mean, just as an American, you really need to chew on that thought. And this is not a political message at all, at all. But you do need to chew on the thought of how valuable liberty is. Either liberty or death are the only options for a life worth living. And with surprising similarity, Paul echoes nearly the same message with the same vehement passion to an audience with the same hunger for liberty. You probably know this, but most of Paul's converts were slaves. Slavery was a big deal in the Roman Empire. Now, slavery in the Roman Empire did not always look like slavery here today. Many of the jobs that we would do from 9 to 5 or beyond would be considered slave jobs in this economy because it was sim simply uh, 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 willing servitude to another master for a certain period of time. And certainly they had other forms of slavery that were the baser forms of slavery that we would be familiar with, as in, uh, slaves in the South where there had no free will. But nonetheless, it doesn't matter. Most of the converts of Paul, though there are different types of slaves, most of them were, in fact, slaves. And so the idea of liberty rang very true in their hearts. <clears throat> One commentator, John Phillips, said this, Christianity took its first, firmest, and fastest root among slaves. If millions of people on those, uh, in those days shared one great common desire, it was the desire to be free. The people he spoke to desired to be free. They longed to have their own freedom. Well, Christ's death, according to Paul, has liberated us that we might be free. I mean, that's how it opens up. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Christ's death has liberated us so that we might be free. But the freedom Paul spoke of was not a physical or political freedom. He's not talking about a Patrick Henry style freedom that frees you physically or frees you politically or even frees you emotionally or frees you to believe whatever you want. That's not the kind of freedom that he's talking about here. No, the Christian liberty that he describes is freedom of conscience, freedom to believe in God freely, freedom of conscience, freedom from the tyranny of the law, freedom from the dreadful struggle to keep the law to win favor with God. I, I don't know if any of you, because I, I, I know most of your testimonies, but I'm not sure if any of you have experienced the slavery of being in chains to a religion that says, unless you do X, Y, and Z, you cannot please God. But friends, that is 
tyranny. That is slavery. To think, have I done enough? Am I good enough? Have I lived a good enough life to go to heaven? Does my good outweigh my bad? Will never allow you to rest your head on your pillow at night and, and know that, that there is eternal security for you. That is slavery. That's bondage. And most of the known world is under that bondage. There are forms of that here in this country today. Every other religion that teaches a works-based salvation presents that bondage. But it seems that the grip of Catholicism has a much stronger hold than many other places around the world and other types of religions that promote salvation through good works. And so long as it's through good works, you are never free. You are never free from the thought that you might not be good enough. Paul says Christ has made us free. Not that physical freedom. Christ can make you free and you could still be a slave. You can still be like Onesimus and others in Scripture, still in bonds but free because you placed your faith in Christ and He has been righteous for you. And you don't have to be. He set you free. When the Galatians first received the Spirit of God, they also received the gift of freedom. As Paul made clear in 2 Corinthians 3.17, he says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When you get saved, when you confess your sins and you say, God, I am not capable of saving myself. I am a sinner. I am incapable of attaining heaven and forgiveness of my own merit. I need you to save me. When you do that, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit of God comes to indwell you. And when he does, that Spirit sets you free from the law of good works. You're free. You're free because all that God will desire of you has been done in Jesus Christ. It's paid for. Man, what a thought. Ah, I feel like we're so familiar with that. We, live, we have lived in freedom so long. I mean the freedom of Christ that we don't understand the full impact of what that means. It is like being an American. I don't think we realize what we have. I was talking to someone last night. I, I, I'm trying to remember who that was, just someone in the community, um, about uh, living in Haiti for two and a half months. Every American, every American needs to go to a third world country. You really do. That changed my life, living in Haiti for two and a half months and seeing people struggle to survive because they had None of the freedoms we enjoy. Man, I'm telling you what. We have it good in Jesus Christ. It's good to remember what we have. To lapse into the idea that we have to win our acceptance with God by our own obedience is unthinkable. And it's unthinkable to Paul. That is exactly what the Galatians were contemplating. Hear the verse again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where, wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. They were, at, they were contemplating going back into a religious system that would put them in bondage. Wait a minute, Pastor. I thought they weren't Jews. That's correct. I thought they didn't know about Judaism before these Judaizers came along. You're right. Well, then how would they go back into bondage? Because the paganism they were in, in was exactly the same. It was make these sacrifices and do these things and, and self-mutilate in order to please your God. It was the same thing. It just had a different name. It was the same bondage. Am I good enough for the gods? He says, you're going back. You're going back, it's just a different form. You're going back to a system that says, have you kept the law? Have you been circumcised? Are you keeping the feasts? Have you worked on the Sabbath? He's saying, don't buy into this. This is returning to bondage. How could you even contemplate that? 
It was not a question of believing in Christ. They had already believed in Christ. But believing their good works could assist Christ in securing their good standing before God. They had accepted Christ before the Judaizers came along. You know that, at least some of the Galatians. But now the, the Judaizers had come along and said, Christ is good, but you need Christ plus. And so they were thinking, well, I'll just, I'll, you know, God will love me more if I believe in Christ and keep the law. After all, God made the law, and he did. So God will love me more if I, if I, if I try to please God by being a good person. And there was no more acceptable good work in the minds of the Judaizers than circumcision, which is why Paul focuses on it here. The sign of God's covenant with the Jews. That was like the, the apex thing you could do in the way of good works. It's to be circumcised. It's that ultimate statement that I'm seeking to be right with God. And so here they had it before them. Let's hold on to Christ and let's find some middle ground where we can practice Judaism, I mean, after all, uh, it, it couldn't hurt, right? Couldn't the, couldn't the Galatians, couldn't these Galatians just believe in Christ and practice Jewish religious custom as they were being urged to do? That way they could have all their bases covered, you know, just in case one doesn't work. They would do their best to live righteously, and if they failed, they had Christ to fall back on. I mean, that seemed like a good plan. I'm going to live like the Judaizers say, I'm going to do the best I can to live a righteous life. And, okay, so Paul, if you're right, if I'm really not good, well, then I have Christ to fall back on, right? Now, understand, and let me just state it in the beginning and in the middle and at the end of this message, that Paul is not teaching you can lose your salvation. But he is teaching that you can lose the uh right way to live if you start messing up the way you think about Christ and you can make it impossible for those who follow you to come to know Christ if you pre present a false gospel. They would do their best to live righteously. And if they failed, they had Christ to fall back on. To this idea, Paul makes it emphatically, emphatically clear there can be no middle ground. Either we are free in Christ or we are in bondage. So with the passion of Patrick Henry, Paul erased any thought of middle ground with three powerful arguments that he highlights in these next few verses. And it begins with this one. He says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, Behold, I, Paul. It's like saying, Look at me. Listen to me. I'm talking to you. That's what he's saying. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the law, uh, to the whole law. I'm sorry, he is a debtor to do the whole law. The three arguments that Paul offers are this. First, here, here's why there is no middle ground. Because Christ has no benefit to good people. Christ has no benefit to good people is, is the argument he's making. Now you might be thinking, why is Paul so bent out of shape over circumcision? I mean, it's like, I mean, I, I get the whole Judaism thing, but th th this seems like such a trivial matter. I mean, after all, circumcision is only a very minor, minor surgical operation on the body. Why did Paul make such a big fuss about it? I mean, why is he like, do not do this? I mean, did you read that with me? I mean, he's like, do not do this or face the consequences. Like, what's the big deal? I mean, it's just a surgical procedure. And, I mean, why fuss about it? Well, because of its doctrinal implications. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot have it both ways. It is impossible to receive Christ, thereby acknowledging that you cannot save yourself. That's how you receive Christ, right? You receive Christ and in doing so, you acknowledge, I cannot save myself. It is impossible to receive Christ and thereby acknowledging you cannot save yourself and then receive circumcision, thereby claiming that you can. I cannot save myself, I have Christ, but I can because I was circumcised. Those don't go together. They don't go together. You have got to choose between a religion of law 
and a religion of grace. You can't have both. You either put your faith in a religion of law, meaning my faith is in me, in my ability to do good, or my faith is in grace, in the grace of God. Those are the only two options. And Paul says, if you choose to put your faith in the law, you're a debtor to the whole law. Right? He says in verse 2, Behold, I, I Paul, say unto you, If ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. We are still in debt to the law without liberty in Christ. You see, what Christ does is he comes and he gives us liberty from the law. He sets us free from the law. He says, you don't have to keep the law. I kept it for you, right? We're free from the law. But the minute you say, I want to be circumcised, okay, then you have to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Thou shalt not lie. Don't ever tell a lie or you've lost your righteousness with God. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. And he goes through the whole thing. And, the, and, and then you've got the Jewish feasts. And then you've got all uh, uh, the, the different uh, Passovers and things of that nature you have to participate in. And if you don't, you will not be right with God. And it's, you know what the Judaizers forgot? They, they, what most of Jews, even to this day, have totally overlooked? That God never intended the law to be a means of righteousness in the first place. The whole point of the law... The whole point of listing out the Ten Commandments and everything beyond was to show, look, you can't be right apart from me. It was just to show you that we're sinners. The knowledge of sin comes from the law. That was the whole point of the law in the first place. God wanted to show mankind you cannot be good on your own. You need a Savior. But man in our own self-righteousness has taken the law tweaked it to fit us and said, I think I can do that. Well, Paul says, you better be careful because the minute you say, I'll accept circumcision, you accept the whole thing. You make yourself a debtor to the whole law and you owe a big debt. It's amazing to me how many people still think they're good. I was talking to a guy this week in my driveway. And I, I asked him, hey, uh, <clears throat> tell me about your spiritual background. And so he did. He gave me a little bit about that and got quite the background and started in one thing and then tried everything, everything, everything you could think of. He just tried all of it. And he said at the end, he said, I got to the conclusion, um, I'm not really sure if there is a God. I, I believe I believe there might be, so I don't think I can be atheist. I think I'm, I'm agnostic. <clears throat> but the way I look at it, I'll just be uh, as good as I can be. I'm just going to be a good person. And, and when I die, if there's a God, well, then I'll know. And it'll be okay because I've been good. Or if I die and there's nothing, well, then I know there wasn't a God. I'll just wait and see. Friend, that's a bad idea. You need to, I don't want to give names or scenarios, but you need to pray for me as I continue that conversation with this man because you're not good enough. You're, you're not going to get to the other side of death and think, yeah, I did pretty well. I didn't rob any banks. I was faithful to my spouse. I didn't kill anybody. It doesn't work that way. Because if you decide you want to go the way of the law, it's not just you can't kill anybody. You can't look with lust. It's not just that you can't rob a bank. You can't take a pencil from that person's desk that doesn't belong to you. You, you see what I'm saying? The, the standard of righteousness is so high, you can't even think a dirty thought. You're toast, friend. You're toast. Christ has no benefit to good people. You see, the minute you start living according, here, here's, here's what the Galatians needed to realize, and here's what I'm trying to communicate to you in verses one or 2 and 3. The reason why there can be no middle ground is because the minute you try to hold on to Christ and good works at the same time, 
Christ becomes of no profit. He's no benefit. He's no benefit to good people. Why? Because they think they're good. They don't need the goodness of Christ. The, 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 the more you pursue this thought that I am good, the less you need a Savior who says, I am your only good. A, 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 is a man good enough to get to heaven without Christ? No. Romans 3, 23, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one's good. You cannot find middle ground with Christ in the law because Christ has no benefit to good people. Secondly, Christ cannot help good people. Verse 4, it says this, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now these are powerful words, they're going to need some explaining. <clears throat> but here's the basic idea. Um, when, he, when he says uh, in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. The first thing we need to say is he is no effect <clears throat> because what can Christ do for a person who feels they can justify themselves? It, it, the, the, the power of Christ is to justify the condemned. That's what Christ does. He can justify the condemned, but he has no effect on those who think they can justify themselves. The, he, he cannot help good people. God cannot help good people. He came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He cannot help people who think they're okay. He can only help the lost. He can only help the sinner. He can only help the humble. He is of none effect otherwise. And to reject his help is to fall from grace. Obviously, this is a misinterpreted passage. I want you to notice with me the condition of this falling. He says, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law. This is important. We're not talking about sanctification or holiness. We're talking about justification. And here's the condition. If you are justified by the law, then you are fallen from grace. It is not that you have grace and then you lose it. Though he is talking to Christians who are dabbling in this old religion... They are not to lose their salvation, but he is saying, if among you there are some who want to be justified by the law and not by Christ, you will have fallen from grace in the same way that the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It means that we're operating in a sphere below the grace of God, right? We cannot... We cannot attain the grace of God so long as we seek justification by the law. Does that make sense? Because that's as best as I got to explain that. It, it does not mean that we can lose our salvation. The condition is prerequisite to the conclusion. And the prerequisite condition is this. You seek to be justified by the law. Well, if you seek to be justified by the law... You have fallen from the grace of God. Grace cannot reach you where you rely on the law. But grace can reach anywhere where a penitent sin sinner will repent. This is the idea. This verse does not describe Christians who seek holiness or justification, but rather unsaved persons who seek justification by law keeping. <clears throat> you in other words, Christ cannot help good people. This, this ought to sink in, and it ought to, it ought to have a, a, a deep ringing in the ears of those who seek to be good. God cannot help you because you are below the reach of grace. And I know these words, they're, they're pretty challenging words because we... We say them, and it sounds like, well, wait a minute, I thought anyone should be saved. Anyone can be saved. Anyone can be saved. Grace exceeds. Where sin abound, grace did much more abound. It's not like the grace of God is insufficient, but it simply cannot help those who don't want it. I mean, that's I don't know how else to say that. Here's grace. If I'm operating down here in law, 
I cannot attain the grace of God. I have to submit myself to the fact that I am a sinner and I cannot save myself. Then the grace of God applies. And then the grace of God is always sufficient. Always, always, always for every sinner and forever, by the way. <clears throat> but God cannot help good people. Christ has, no benef Christ has no benefit to good people. Christ cannot help good people. And finally, Christ has no use for good people. And verse 5 and 6, the tables are turned where he says, For through the Spirit we wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Now I love that first verse. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You might be asking, okay, so we can't be good, but cert shouldn't believers, I mean, you've professed faith in Jesus Christ, shouldn't we desire to be good? Don't we want to be righteous? Yeah. But who in us, uh, who among us here would raise their hand and say, Pastor, I achieved it this week. I didn't sin. I'm good. Like, I was debating not coming to church, but I thought I should come for the benefit of the other sinners. You know, is, is that your attitude today? No, that's not your attitude. You realize I'm a sinner. I can't make it through a day without sinning. Anybody else like that? Like it happens every day. Every day, more than once per day. I, we want to get down to the hours and minutes. It'd be embarrassing. I mean, we can't make it long. And we're aware of this fact. It's not like, well, you know, I haven't sinned for a couple years now that I'm a mature believer. It doesn't work that way. We sin. Well, we need to be righteous. So when is that going to happen? I'm glad you asked. Because here's what it says. For we, through the Spirit... Wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Here's what we wait for. The Spirit of God came to live in our hearts. Oh, this is a beautiful thing. The Bible says he's the earnest of our inheritance. You've heard of earnest money. Earnest money is that down payment. The Holy Spirit is Christ's down payment into our life that we will claim righteousness in heaven. Right? We have the down payment of Christ's righteousness. The full delivery of that righteousness is when we walk through those pearly gates and we receive the full righteousness of Christ. And, and, and how do we have this hope? It's by faith. It's by faith because I look in the mirror and I see a dirty, rotten, wicked sinner that's not moving in the right direction. Maybe you're better than I. But I don't find myself getting more holy in my flesh as the, as the years go by. Now, now. Don't get me wrong, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to sin less, that we'll never be sinless, right? We understand this, but I'm just talking about in my flesh. It's just as wicked today as the day I became self-aware of my sin. I've, I, I've, it's never gotten any better. I'm a sinner, and yet I have hope. I have hope that it's not going to stay this way. How? By faith. I put my faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ who gave me the down payment of his spirit, that when I get to heaven, that righteousness will be complete. Sin will be gone. It's not like I'm not trying to pursue righteousness. I am every day. I try to sin less. And every day I have the hope, one day it's going to be made right. But that's far different. That's far different than trying to live a good life and saying, I think I'm doing pretty good. It's far different than saying, you know, I think my good's going to outweigh my bad. Just, just keep doing good. Do you understand? I, I mean, it's far different than the gentleman in my driveway saying, well, I'm doing pretty good. I think I'll wait till I die. And if there is a God, I'll know. And it'll be all right then. It won't. It won't. This is a serious matter. But Christ has no use for good people. He, we want to be good, and, and, and Christ will give us his goodness in heaven. But look at the next verse. It says, for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. Do you know what Christ has use for? 
He doesn't have use for your stated goodness or your lack thereof. He doesn't look at you and say, well, you know, you were pretty easy to save. <laughs> he doesn't look at you. He doesn't come to a five-year-old boy, which is how I got saved at five. That's extremely young. He doesn't come to me and say, you know what, five, your, your, your record's looking pretty clean. You've got some sins here, some disobedience to parents, and some lying here. But really, nothing like I'm dealing with with everybody else. You're pretty good. You know, your, your circumcision means nothing to God. Your, your good works. He doesn't come to you and say, as an older person, well, you kind of live for yourself as a younger man or as a younger woman. But I see in your older years, you've really become philanthropic and you give a lot and you really go out of your way to help people and you've made it easy on me. No, it means nothing. But neither does uncircumcision mean anything to God. Neither does God come to the lowest man in the gutter and say, boy, you've really messed up, haven't you? You've cheated on your wife. You've lost your job. You've fallen into drugs and alcohol. You've, you've got a record, a police record, and, you know, you barely made it in. No, friend, we all get in on the same level. As, as it has been wisely said, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. It, it, it's all the same. We get in all the same. All your good works mean nothing to God. All your sins mean nothing to God. They all come under the blood of Jesus Christ. God has no use for good people. <clears throat> circumcision means nothing. By the way, the issue, of course, was not circumcision per se, but what circumcision represented. It's probably good to remind ourselves in this whole discussion, Paul was circumcised. He was. And so we ought to be careful not to say, if you're circumcised, you're going to hell. That's definitely not what this is teaching for the man who was circumcised himself. By the way, Paul also circumcised Timothy, Acts chapter 16, verse 3. He circumcised Timothy so that he might better be a minister to the Jews that he was attempting to reach. So that, it, it, let, let's, let's address what's actually at, at stake here. It's not circumcision, but what it represented. And it means nothing to God, right? And so does uncircumcision. You know, some people look at law. It, it, th this, this is a... Well, this is a problem even today, all right? Let's be honest, okay? We're of a Here I am, I'm in a tie. This is a rare thing, right? This, this suit and tie thing is rare today. And, and, and the only reason why I do it, and, and I've told you this before, but the only reason why, I don't think you have to. It's not a, it's not a spiritual thing at all. I, I, I'm just trying to evaluate culture, and I have asked myself the question, does culture have too much reverence for God or not enough? If it had too much reverence for God, which at times in history it did, like in the Victorian era, I dressed down church to make God uh, uh, approachable to mankind. But I feel like that's not our problem. I feel like our problem is that there's not enough reverence for God. That's the only reason why I'm doing this. Okay, but can I say this? You can do this like this and start looking down on those who don't. You can sing hymns and look down on those who don't. You can go to church. We go to church like a ridiculous amount of times. I mean, nobody else is doing this. I helped uh, uh, some neighbors move in yesterday. And like, you're that church that has church at 530, aren't you? I thought, wow, that's super convenient if we can't make it in the morning. I'm like, I know. We're the only church around that has evening services. We do it all the time. And you know what? You can go to church a lot and you can dress up and you can do certain things and read your Bible and pray and do all the things and think, pretty good you know what that means to God nothing there's a danger on the other side I think this needs to be addressed as well there are people who would not do any of that who would who would not quite make fun of but really disdain and mock you wear a suit on Sunday you sing hymns you go to church a ridiculous don't you know you don't need to do all that and and, and in some respect have a sense of I'm doing more righteousness by not doing the good worky stuff. Do you know what that means to God? Nothing. Neither circumcision nor uns it doesn't mean anything to God. God has, look, we need to get it in our heads. God has no use for good people, only for sinners. God can do a lot with a sinner. <laughs> Who loves them? Yeah. 
neither position is anything to God. Well, wh what's important to God? What shouldn't we do something for God? Are we? I mean, it's, I don't want to paralyze you. You know, it's like, man, ne neither good works are good for God or not good works. You know, <laughs> like, what do we do? You know, there's <laughs> nothing. Okay, well, he comes to a pretty reasonable conclusion. In verse 6, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which worketh by love. It's not like there's no works. It's not like you can't do something for God. But it needs to be done through faith and in love. Do you know what a sinner does for Christ? He works for him out of love. Remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to go to your house today. Zacchaeus was a dirty, rotten sinner like the rest of us, a tax collector, and he knew it. When he came down, he was so moved by the love of God for him. He did something good. He said, if I owe anything to anyone, I'm going to pay it back plus more. I, I want to clear all my debts. I, I want to do right. He came to fishermen who had no future, and he said, follow me, and they left their nets and followed him. That sounds like a good work. Right. And we could go on and on and on about good things. Good people have done. But there's a whole different motivation when, when you come to the woman at the well, when you come to the woman at the well and you give her living water and you give her salvation and a free gift. And, and without being instructed now, in order to be a good Christian, you need to go witness without the, any instruction. She runs back to town and says, come see a man wh which knew all that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Why is she doing that? Because she found the love of Jesus Christ. And by faith in him, she did good. That's what God loves. He, God has no use for good people. He just has use for sinners who love him and serve him by faith. Who place their faith in him. So now that we've worked our way all the way through the text. So what's the conclusion? What are we supposed to do with this information? I suppose most of you have a profession of faith, if I, if I understand correctly. Well, you know, to arrive at the conclusion, you gotta re, we, we got to return to the opening command. Because this whole text is based on that opening sentence. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Stand fast. You know what Paul is saying in this whole text? You have everything to lose and nothing to gain if you do not stand fast in Christ and fight for your liberty. You have everything to lose and nothing to gain if you do not stand fast. Well, what does that mean? Can, can we just divide it up? Those who are saved and those who are seeking what does that mean to the saved? What does that mean to you and me? If you do not stand fast in the faith, if you compromise for the sake of unity, you will be complicit in sending people to hell. You have everything to lose and nothing to gain if we don't stand fast. You know what's easy to do when we talk about the subject of middle ground between good works and faith. You know what we want to do? You know what our human inclination is to do? It's to not be divisive. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. If you, if you like, no, I love it. That's probably a bigger problem, right? But our human inclination is to not be divisive. Maybe we have relatives or sons or daughters or grandkids or neighbors or coworkers or you fill in the blank. People... We go to school with. We don't want to be divisive. We don't. We don't. We don't want to be the person that 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 disturbs other people with information like you've got to accept Jesus Christ, or there is an eternity in hell apart from Him. That's a hard thing to even talk about. But Paul says you must stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. You've got, to, you've got to promote the liberty in Jesus Christ because if you do not, there's no middle ground. It's not like 
It's not like this. It's not like, well, I'll say a little bit about Jesus and I'll let them keep a little bit of their ideas of works and it'll all work out because they'll have a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of their own self-righteousness and it will be okay. It will not be okay. People will spend an eternity somewhere. Heaven or hell. That is it. And the only way most likely the people in your life will ever know a Savior is through you. It's through me. We've got to stand fast on their behalf. We must. We must. But maybe you're here today or maybe you know someone who is a seeker. And you're, you're, you're betwixt two, right? You, you, you're seeking to be justified with God. And you're thinking, well, I know what Jesus Christ says, but I still feel like I'm a good person. <clears throat> if you do not reject your own good works and follow, uh, excuse me, and allow Christ to liberate you from your own self-righteousness, you will remove yourself from the reach of God's grace. This is why we must stand fast in the message of Jesus Christ. If you're a seeker and you come to Christ and you say, well, I appreciate who God is. And many people have this opinion. I appreciate Jesus Christ. I appreciate him. I know all about him. I've read the stories. I believe in him. And I know I can receive him. But I feel like I'm a good person. And I, th I think it'll be okay if I just believe in both. I'm going to do my best to be good. And I'm going to hold on to Christ and I'm going to hold on to the goodness. And you know, when I get to heaven, it'll all just sort itself out. Friend, it will not. It will not. To do such is to remove yourself from grace. It is to fall from the grace of God. Because God's grace is only available to those who refuse to trust themselves. You must stand fast. You have everything to lose and nothing to gain if you do not stand fast. This week tore me up spiritually. There are a lot of things I need work on. There's a lot of, a lot of things under the hood that this guy needed work on. The thing I wasn't really prepared to be confronted with was, I need to tell people about Jesus. I was like, well, yeah, I already knew that part. Let's get to the revival part that I didn't know. Does that make sense to anybody? I don't know if you felt the same way. I was like, oh, yeah, I know. I need to tell people about Jesus. And it's like, no, wait a second. Wait a second. You have everything to lose and nothing to gain if you don't tell other people about Jesus. You have everything to lose and nothing to gain if you don't accept Jesus. It seems like that's the real issue. It's almost the only issue. Church, we need to stand fast in our commitment to preach the gospel. We have to. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. My fear is that in my relationship to other people, I will only go so far as to tell them about Christ and not pull them from self-righteousness. Do you understand what I mean? Like I've done my duty. I, I've told them about Jesus. They know what I believe. Friend, you can't stop there. That middle ground of, well, you have a little bit of Jesus now and a little bit of what you have is never going to work. There's no middle ground. Every head bowed, every eye closed.